appearances can often be misleading. From a young age, she found herself thrust into the world of assassination, barely past high school. For six years, she existed in the shadows, evading capture. Each clash between rival factions left a trail of devastation in its wake. When we conjure images of Narcos, figures like Pablo Escobar or El Chapo typically come to mind, formidable men surrounded by loyal, fierce associates. Yet, what if I told you that some of the most formidable narcos in South America were women? These are the women who stood beside notorious drug lords, commanding entire branches of the illicit trade and demonstrating the ruthlessness required to seize control of cartels. If this revelation surprises you, you are not alone. After all, society often associates warfare and power struggles with men. Zainab Salvi said of women, like life, peace begins with women. We are the first to forge lines of allies and collaborate across conflict divides. Those both unfolds when women embrace arms. Let's examine some of the most notorious female figures in a history of narcotics. Meet La Catrina, also known as Maria Guadalupe Lopez Esquivel. She spearheaded a notorious squad that left a trail of devastation wherever they went. Maria's roots were modest. She hailed from a rancher's family, raised by a housewife. Growing up in Temple Catapec, she harbored no desire to remain there. Disliking school, she shunned the prospect of a conventional life in 2017. She fled her home and found refuge with a member of Jalisco, new generation cartel in Aguila. Maria fell for Miguel Fernandez a prominent figure in narcotics baron. Maria's entry into the cartel wasn't driver or romantic entanglements. Rather, it was fielded by her search for recognition and wealth. Swiftly, she ascended through the ranks of the cartel, reaping substantial profit. Almost immediately, she floundered her newfound riches on social media platforms. Soon, she adopted the moniker La Catrina, paying homage to the iconic figure from the day of the dead festival. La Catrina, became a prominent member of a formidable group of young and attractive female soldiers who utilized their allure and innocent facade to entice and eliminate rival gang members. However, Maria's ambitions didn't help there. Maria swiftly rose to lead her team and eventually assumed command of a little hit squad. Under her leadership, the squad carried out numerous assassinations, extortions, and kidnappings. In October 2017, Mexican law enforcement officers were executing a warrant at a residence when they were ambushed by La Catrina's squad, resulting in a devastating massacre. 13 officers lost their lives, and many others sustained injuries as the squad unleashed chaos. They even set two police car ablaze, sending a clear message. They were prepared for war against the authorities, and La Catrina exuded an aura of invincibility. During the attack, officer discerned La Catrina's voice issuing commands for the killing, pinpointing her as a mastermind behind the assault. Recognizing the urgency to apprehend her, on January 10, 2020, acting on a tip-off, the National Guard swiftly moved to surround the squad's safe house, triggering a violent confrontation. However, this time it was a squad that bore the brunt of the assault. La Catrina sustained a gunshot round to the jugular. While she was airlifted for medical treatment, her accomplices were swiftly subdued, forced onto their knees, and apprehended. Tragically, at the tender age of 21, Maria Lopez succumbed to her injuries inside the helicopter due to the significant blood loss. Meet Sandra Avila Beltran, a figure marked by a life of crime and turbulent relationships, which ultimately led to her downfall. Sandra's path diverged early from that of conventional life. She was essentially born into the Sinaloa cartel, with her maternal relatives renowned as heroin smugglers, and her father, Alfonso Avia Quintero, linked to the leadership of the Guadalajara cartel through his brother, Rafael Caro Quintero. Sandra's upbringing in the 1960s exposed her to wars of cold-blooded transactions, hard negotiations, and the use of violence as a mean of persuasion, a language she became fluent in from a tender age. At the tender age of 13, Sandra assumed the role of her father's official money counter, while also bearing witness to a harrowing shootout. Sandra pursued higher education, studying journalism at a prestigious university. However, her peers remember her as a reserved and perpetually suspicious individual. Yet, this demeanor was merely a facade. At 21, Sandra entered into a relationship with Armando Carlos Fuentes, the head of the Juarez Cartel 
Concurrently, she solidified her position with the Sinaloa cartel, overseeing the trafficking of illegal substances into the U.S. Though her relationship with Fuentes proved short life, Sandra's romantic life was characterized by strategic rather than sentimental unions. Her two marriages were with ex-police commanders turned traffickers, individuals well versed in the interests of Mexico's law enforcement landscape. Their expertise proved invaluable, enabling Sandra to navigate legal loopholes. Ironically, both of Sandra's husbands met their demise at the hand of hired assassins. Among her humored paramours was none other than El Chapo himself. While the true nature of their relationship remains shrouded in mystery, one fact remains indisputable. Sandra held a pivotal role as a head of public relations for the Sinaloa cartel. Sandra embarked on yet another tumultuous liaison, this time with Juan Diego Espinosa Ramirez, also known as the Tiger, who boasted strong ties to the Norte del Valle cartel in Colombia. This alliance proved to be gateway Sandra needed. Her union with the Tiger facilitated a formidable partnership between Colombian and Mexican cartels, leading to unprecedented profit for Sinaloa. In 2001, U.S. authorities seized a tuna fishing vessel transporting 9 tons of cocaine. The magnitude of these busts hinted at the substantial volumes that had likely steeped House authorities before the DEA's intervention. It was following this incident that Sandra earned her moniker, the Queen of the Pacific, with law enforcement agencies hot on her trail, intensifying efforts to dismantle the Sinaloa cartel. Sandra lived the fugitive existence for six years, enduring the anguish of her son's kidnapping as a consequence of her violent negotiation tactics. In 2007, she was apprehended. Your name, por favor. Sandra Avila Beltran. ¿De dónde es originaria? Tijuana, Baja California. Upon her apprehension, when questioned about her occupation, Sandra defines the claim to be in the closing business. Despite being convinced and sentenced to life imprisonment, she vehemently maintained her innocence, protesting her incarceration. During her time behind bars, she made demands for favorable conditions, access to alcohol and cigarettes. When denied certain privileges, she alleged violations for her basic rights. In 2015, Sandra was released from prison and currently resides in Guadalajara. This is La Jafe. La Jafe meaning the boss, aptly describes Anadina Ariano Feliz's position in the Mexican cartel board. Born on April 12, 1961, in Sinaloa, Anadina hailed from a family entrenched in the trafficking trade, with her relatives serving as her early influences. Her older brother operated under their uncle, the infamous drug lord and Guadalajara cartel boss, Miguel Anger Fligolardo. Despite earning a bachelor's degree in accounting, Anadina didn't utilize her education to distance herself from cartel activities. Instead, she leveraged her expertise to aid her six brothers, assisting them with money laundering as a financial advisor to the Tijuana cartel. However, in 1989, the downfall of the Guadalajara cartel ensued, resulting in the arrest or demise of most of its members. Several positions of power became available within the cartel, and Adina entered into a passionate relationship with Armando Lopez, a close associate of El Chapo. However, the romance was short-lived as two of Anatina's older brothers disapproving of the relationship, assassinating Armando, a drastic measure to express their dissent. Yet, far from being deterred, this event fueled Anadina's determination to assert her dominance within the cartel hierarchy. In 2000, following the admise of El Chiu, the cartel's financial overseer, Anadina seized the opportunity to assume his rule. Over time, she successfully outmaneuvered her brothers. In 2008, one of her brothers, El Eduardo, was apprehended by authorities, further consolidating Anadina's position as a leader of the Tijuana cartel. Anadina, or La Jafe, stands apart from other women discussed today. She embodies Zainab Sabi's code, which is rather unusual for a cartel boss. Since the 1990s, Anadina has been known for a rash methodical approach to conducting business and for her preference for peaceful. She avoids resorting to violence or giving direct orders for assassination. She focuses on negotiations, utilizing bribe and illegal substance trade, while she may not be considered a saint. Her discreet and quiet tactics have allowed her to evade the attention of the DEA and Mexican authorities for years, safeguarding both her own life and the lives of her son. Despite leading one of the largest Mexican cartels, she prefers to remain in the shadows.